Hey there, everybody. Today we'll be talking about the rise of the Qin and Han dynasties. Before we dive in, we'll spend a little time discussing Confucianism and Taoism. We'll also touch on legalism. Before we dive into the policies of the Qin and their achievements and move on to the Han. So first, take a look at the borders, especially the Han, how they've pushed out even pa a little bit past their modern day borders, which is pretty impressive. So discussing Confucianism and Taoism, just a quick review for you. Confucius, a.k.a. Kongzi, was born in 551 BCE. And the only record that we have of the life of Confucius or his thoughts are recorded in the Analects. And it's various discussions and conversations that he had. And the Analects are still around. You'll be reading them this week. And the main point of Confucianism is ethics and respect. And Confucius emphasized filial piety or respect for one's parents. They say jump, you say how high, you defer to your parents. If they say do something, you do it, no questions asked. Now, the important thing to remember about Confucianism is it doesn't discuss the supernatural, it doesn't discuss the afterlife, it does not require the worship of a god or many gods. And because of that, Confucianism is more of a life philosophy than it is a religion. Taoism, what we know about Taoism dates back to about 300 BCE. And Taoism and Confucian texts are found side by side. And this shows us that they're not generally perceived as competing belief systems, but rather two belief systems that play off of each other. And the major feature of Taoist is um, meditation, control of action. And basically central to this is the concept of Wu Wei, um, allowing things to go their natural course, basically go with the flow. Don't fight against nature. All right, moving on, um, another review, the Warring States period. So during the spring and autumn period under the Zhou, which went from 770 to 476 BCE, dozens of big and small states came into eight states that remained by 476. And these eight states were continuously warring, hence the Warring States period. And the leader of these states, are, you're going to have the Zhou and you're going to have the Qin. And during the first half of the Warring States period, the boundaries between the states remain, for the most part, roughly the same. But... Uh, nomads began invading the the Qin kingdom, and the Qin were actually able to fight these people off. And because of that, they gained a reputation. And what they started doing after was going into the other seven states, conquering and absorbing them into their empire, which is how we get the Qin dynasty. The 250 years between 475 and 221 BCE we call that the Warring States period simply because the Zhou Dynasty collapses into eight states, which is how the Qin are able to take over. And again, another map. Uh, what I do want you to focus on is the Great Wall because you can thank the Qin Dynasty for that. And unknown for, for sure, but a lot of historians believe that the name China comes from the Qin. All right, so unifying Qin China. By 20, uh, 221 BCE, the state of the Qin had unified all of northern and central China, really creating the first Chinese empire. So we've had states before in China, but now we've got the first empire. And again, it comes from being able to fight against the barbarian neighbors. The Qin also adopted legalist methods which basically says that people are inherently evil and will only do what they are told and will only be good if there is a strong leader to tell them what to do. And this is actually very similar to the belief of Thomas Hobbes. If you've taken uh, government classes, we've discussed him and he, he really had the same belief of this. And 
behind this legalist method, you had a very ambitious king named She Huangdi. And in addition to being ambitious, incredibly ruthless, very tough, would do whatever it takes to get the job done. And upon uniting China, She Huangdi established a strong centralized state because he eliminated any rival center of authority. He also created a very strong bureaucracy and in doing so was able to put out a lot of standardizations, especially coinage. That was a pretty big deal, but also law measurements and writing. And following the advice of his prime minister to really solidify his claim on the Qin Empire, he suppressed Confucianism. And under him, it was not allowed. To practice Confucianism could result in one's death. In order to secure the empire's borders from the northern raiders who he originally defeated, he sent a large military force to drive them out. And to make sure they would not come back, Shei Huangdi ordered the construction of the Great Wall of China. And it's actually an ancestor to the Great Wall. The Great Wall that we know of, you see that um, completed under the Ming, but he begins building extensions to walls that were built earlier, connecting the walls, and this is the ancestor to what eventually becomes the Great Wall of China. Unfortunately, his attacks on the nomads actually unite them into one large group called the Xiongnu Confederacy. And this does create a massive threat for China for centuries to come. This is actually one of the reasons the Han Dynasty will collapse. And you can thank Shei Hongdi for that. To fulfill their military and labor needs, the Qin government instituted a very oppressive program that required labor services from peasants and also compulsory military service. Now, the Qin were only in power for 14 years. Um, and we'll talk about why in just a minute. Um, the public works projects that were carried out using conscripted labor included, in addition to the wall, thousands of miles of roads, which is great, but also a very elaborate tomb for the first emperor. And while people were being kidnapped from their homes, fathers and sons, and sent to build this wall for Shui Hongdi, if they weren't building it fast enough, hands would be cut off. If they died on the job, they would just be tossed in. He was an incredibly overly eager to, to show his strength and his power. But that's really not what caused the downfall. It's the fact that building these, these roads and these walls is incredibly expensive. So you can take from this that it doesn't matter if you kidnap or maim people as long as you keep the taxes lower. Great guy. And then he dies in 210 BCE. And he was buried in the monumental tomb that he had ordered to be built. But he did do something a little differently. Under the Shang, under the Zhou, people would be sacrificed to be put in the emperor's tomb. He did something different. He actually had a terracotta army built. And the soldiers were then placed in his tomb. And these terracotta soldiers are in, in excellent shape. Um, they're actually in multiple museums. Um, and Shei Huangdi predicted when he came to the throne that his family would rule for a thousand, what was it? A, a, it was a thousand years, but how he put it was like a thousand sons or, or something. And they only ruled for 14 years. That stinks. Um, his son did secure the throne, but was a weak leader, and Qin rule was over by 206 BCE. And I want to talk to you about these terracotta soldiers. Um, as you know, I was an exchange student in college, and I went to London for a weekend. And while I was there, naturally, I had to go to the History Museum. And there was a sign. And the terracotta army, there was actually going to be a showing of the terracotta army. And I arrived two weeks early. You see, the terracotta army was coming two weeks after I was due to leave, and I didn't get to see it. The vocab phrase of the day is a bitter shrew, because you, get, you see, guys, this, this was eight years ago, and I still have yet to let it go. Hmm. But anyway, moving on to the Han. 
We're talking about Han government and imperial bureaucracy. The Han Dynasty was founded in 206 BCE when Liu Bang, who was actually a former Qin official, rebelled against the second Qin emperor. Hey, hey, guys, mandate of heaven, and became the leader. And he actually took the name of Gao Zhu. He was a peasant. I do want you to keep that in mind as well. Now, the Han established a political system that drew on both Confucian philosophy and legalist techniques. So you've got the blending of two different styles of government. Um, in order to make the transition a bit easier. The Han would rule China for 400 years with a brief interruption from 9 to 23 CE. And one of the first thing the Han dynasty does is they cede half of the Qin lands to independent kings. And to ease the transition and to help the economy, the Han also reduced taxes and government spending. And they also collected and stored extra grain for times of shortage. They're actually preparing for this. The Han also had confrontation with the Xiongnu Confederacy. And what this did is it revealed the inadequacy of the Han troops. And basically, Gao Zhu just developed policies of appeasement to buy them off. And sometimes it was gifts of silk. Sometimes it was gifts of rice. Other times, uh, as I said before, he ceded half of the Qin lands to independent kings. He would marry off the king's daughters into the Xiongnu Confederacy just to keep the appeasement. And... One thing that I always find really interesting, if you've seen the Disney movie Mulan, they've actually taken three different dynasties and combined it into one story. So Mulan, if she did exist, was probably alive either in the Shea dynasty or the Shang dynasty. Um, Shang Nu, they've, they've named one guy after an entire confederacy. He's the, the guy with the bird, naturally the bad guy. Um, he was really active. Um, as the, the guy trying to take over China, but that's an entire confederacy and they're active in the Qin, the Han, and dynasties to follow. And the wall that you see, that completed wall, was actually finished in the Ming. So don't listen to Disney. It's all about the History Channel, guys. Anyway, um, the Han went through a period of territorial expansion under Emperor Wu. And Wu was trying to increase the power of the empire and how he did that was not just through expansion, but he also built up his military to fight the nomads and military technology was a very popular thing in the later half of the Han. In addition with Confucianism, and I apologize because that seems to have gotten cut off. So we'll just zoom down for a minute. Wu's reign. Okay. It disappeared a lot. Um, saw the expansion of territory and instituted some rather controversial monopolies on high-profile goods. Basically, he put a tax and a price freeze and a government monopoly on salt and iron, the two things that everybody needs, which, if you think about it, is a bit genius because everyone's going to buy it, but then the government controls it. And in addition, Han education was helped by the invention of paper in the second century BCE. And from China, paper spread to the Islamic world and then to Europe by the 11th century. The Han was the first dynasty that actually required their government officials to study classical writings on ritual history, poetry, and uh, literature. As you can see, the Han... Very impressive. Chinese society, um, under the Han, especially because it incorporates Confucianism, family is the basic unit of society. And the family was conceived as an unbroken chain of generations, whether they were alive or whether they were dead. Ancestral veneration was incredibly popular under the Han. And in traditional Chinese society, it still is popular. The Chinese believed that a hierarchy in the family was crucial, dominated by the eldest male, whether that was the oldest brother or if the father was still alive. And it was also very normal to have multiple generations living under one roof. So you would have the grandparents and then their son or sons and their wives and then their grandchildren. 
Their daughters, however, would marry out into the husband's household, and then they became part of that family. Wives were expected to to be obedient and then especially recognize their mother-in-law's authority over them. During the Western Han, the capital was at Chang'an, but eventually it would move. We will talk about that in a little bit. Most women were not educated um, in the traditional sense. They were educated to be wives and mothers. So cooking, cleaning, um, sewing. Keep in mind, guys, there's no sewing machines. All of these garments that you've seen in uh, paintings, they're all made by hand. And it was the woman's job to make clothing for her entire family. And what you need to keep in mind is that it wasn't just her husband herself and her children. Quite often it was her husband's parents, um, older relatives that live within the house. And again, this got cut off as well. That's awesome. Uh, Merchant families. Whoops. There we go. Sorry, small difficulties. Merchant families tended to be based in the cities, but under Confucianism... Merchants were seen as as sort of the low of society because they're not actually contributing anything to the greater the greater good. Peasants, however, even though they are lower class, because they're doing the farm work, they are seen as crucial. Han period was very rich in intellectual developments. Uh, Sima Qin was the chief astrologer of Emperor Wu, and he's often compared to Herodotus for documenting Chinese history. And in terms of technology, the Han saw the development of the water mill, a usable horse collar, paper, horse breeding to supply the cavalry, and a reliable crossbow trigger, in addition to the thousands of miles of road that both the Qin and the Han built. The Han also incorporated Taoism in addition to Confucianism. Um, But Buddhism was also introduced to China in the first century CE. It was probably spread by merchants on the Silk Road. And because Buddhism called for monks to and, and nuns as well to withdraw from families, withdraw from society and abstain from sex, it came into conflict with Confucian beliefs because one of the the biggest parts of Confucianism, family values, and procreation of children to maintain the cult of ancestral worship. And over time, this would lead to a gradual reshaping of society because you do have Buddhists who are leaving society. Um, Buddhism would also be changed in China to fit the needs. Decline of the Han. Um, A very ambitious high official seized power from 9 to 23 CE, but he was killed in the palace, and a member of the Han royal family was then put in his place. At this time, the capital was then moved to Laoyang, becoming known as the Eastern Han, and then the Eastern Han period. And as you guys have learned, when you have to move your capital, bad things happen. Moving the capital from um, Rome to Byzantium and rename it Constantinople, moving your capital from Chang'an to Laoyang. And the imperial court was plagued by weak leadership and court intrigue. And then nobles and merchants built up large land holdings at the expense of small farmers and peasants. And the small farmers and peasants sought tax relief, which reduced revenues for the empire. And then military conscription broke down and the central government had to rely on mercenaries whose loyalty only goes as far as you can actually pay them. And after 220 CE, when the Han officially fall, China enters a period of political and the word you can't see here is is fragmentation. So I do want you to take a moment to look at some of the similarities and the differences. So looking at your similarities, trading was big. Um, trading united um, China to Rome, the Silk Road. Um, the first Han to discover the Silk Road was probably in um, an envoy of the emperor in about 139 CE. And the Han would eventually begin trading with the Xiongnu for horses, other animals, and jade. The Shangnu Confederacy does break up in 60 BCE and doesn't threaten the Han because of that trading relationship, but you do have other nomads who will continue to invade. 
Um, the Han were able to conquer, but their power was weak and their control was weak. Similar to Rome, what happens when your empire just gets too big? Now, there are some differences. Um, in China, the imperial model was revived. Territory of the Han is reunified, but the Roman Empire is never again uh, unified. It's never brought back to its glory. And big differences include the concept of the individual. China, it's more about the greater good. Rome, it's the individual. Um, economic mobility in the middle classes in Rome. Rome, you have a chance to move up. Han, China, it's got those relationships. It's your place in society. Um, Rome was dependent on slave labor. China's dependent on peasant labor. Religions are also very different, as are political ideologies. In Rome, emperors were often seen as gods, um, especially Augustus. He was worshipped as a god after he died. The emperors are worshipped as gods quite often after they die, and in life they're revered. The emperor is not seen as a god. He's more seen as the middleman. You can compare that to Mesopotamia and Egypt. So if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to email me. Otherwise, have a great night, guys. Cheers.